ABC Listen. Podcasts, radio, news, music and more. Chris Neen is back on Conversations today. You might remember Chris's story growing up in Blacktown in Western Sydney with an extraordinary grandmother who was obsessed with fairy tales and ideals of female virginal innocence. The grandmother who then won the lottery and set up a fantastical and doomed tourist attraction in Queensland called Dragon Hall. Chris's own journey through the world has been no less remarkable and has required Chris as an author to confront questions of sex and destiny and ancestry. And now Chris has confronted something that many people are really, truly unwilling to look at and talk about, the shape of their own body. After years of struggle and shame and diets that made Chris unwell, Chris has had to come to terms with the multiple private and public indignities that come with growing large, clothes that don't fasten properly, the irritable stares from strangers, and this is despite all the stuff that's been said and published in recent times about body positivity. Chris Neen's new book is called Fat Girl Dancing. Welcome back. Hello. Hello. Lovely to be here again, Richard. It feels, I have to say, really weird talking about this stuff with you. It feels like I'm violating some kind of a taboo, like it's something that mean kids in the playground do, talking about your body shape. What do you think that tells us about these taboos around fatness in the culture? It is one of the last taboos. Um, it's obviously not the last taboo to be fat, but it's certainly, it's still one of those things that anyone who's like a, a comedian can poke fun at people who are fat still, whereas if they start poking fun at someone for their cultural background or for their sexuality, there's a backlash. But fatness is one of those things that we still seem to be allowed to make fun of people for their fatness. And we still don't even want to talk about fatness. So if somebody is a fat person, they often don't want to admit it. They don't want to come out as fat. And that's kind of what I decided I really had to do after all these years of living in a fat body. I realised I had to come out which was a bit of a strange experience for me. <laughs> Coming out as a fat person, that's a wild idea. I found this, of all your books, the most enjoyable to read. Why did you want to write this book to begin with? What led you to write about what must be and what you've said is a painful subject for you? I really do believe that as a writer, I need to write about the things that I don't want to write about the most. I think that that is where the important stuff is. If you're scared of something, then that's the thing you really need to talk about because um, that kind of fear is natural because we, it's something that we don't touch. It's some taboo. It's something that we don't want to look at. But the more we hide things away, the more they fester and become really horrible, horrible, shameful things for us. And so I think that I'm always attracted to the things that I really am frightened of and don't want to talk about. And the really big taboo for me all of these years has been fatness and my fatness. And in fact, I started a file with the title Fat Book way before <laughs> I, ever, I ever released my first book. And I kept putting things in there of, you know, little things that had happened to me about you know, my body. And I couldn't face writing it into a book. I just couldn't do it for all of these years. So I have actually been avoiding it. And I finally realised, I think I need to actually attack it. I, I think I need to confront it and work out why I feel so bad about myself being fat. You know, I'm conscious of the fact you wrote that you think as a writer, you need to run towards the subjects that most frighten you. Not take careful, tentative steps toward it. You just use the word attack as well, <laughs> run towards. So. If you take really hesitant steps, you're going to stop and turn around and run away. <laughs> like that's in, in terms of my, right. I'm a very, I'm a scaredy cat, you know. Yeah. I'm kind of the person who, if I give myself time to think about something, I'm just not going to do it. So if you're going to get on the most evil roller coaster in the theme park, you've just got to run on board, strap yourself in and close off your options perhaps? I think that's exactly <laughs> right. If I hesitate, I'm, gonna, I'm really not going to do it. I'll let myself off the hook. So for me, if I really want to do something, I have to go straight at it and hard. I was really moved to read the statement in your book, fatness is the one thing that scares me most about myself. What are the demons giving voice to those fears, do you think? I think I've 
been um, picking up from our culture the way I should be feeling about myself for all of my life. I've been seeing nothing but thin people as the the main characters of stories, thin people being celebrated in beauty contests, thin people being on movies as the movie stars. And whenever I've seen a fat person, it's only been a comedian who can then laugh at their own body and their own weight becomes a subject for um, them to laugh at. So I really I haven't actually seen my own body represented in the world and I've been gathering these voices in my head because I've been living in this culture and I've been seeing how people feel about fatness. They're like little needles that kind of get into you and they they get into your body and they stick in there and then whenever you kind of look in the mirror, they prick at you. So for me, I've just been gathering all these tiny little um, needles all my life they got to a point where they became my own voice, where I was feeling that about myself. So instead of it being the world talking to me, it was me talking to myself and being really horrible to myself about my body. People think that they can be horrible to fat people with impunity. Tell me about a conversation you overheard between two private school boys on a bus one day. Oh, it was it's really horrible because I'm an adult grown person and here I am sitting on a bus and there was two kids in, you know, full uniforms with the the little kind of jackets and the hats looking all proper and they were talking about bullying and they must have had something at school where there was a a bullying lesson and they um, were talking about how you weren't allowed to bully people for being gay anymore and that was kind of a thing that they were kind of, you know, and I was listening in because I thought, oh, that's really cool that these kids are being taught you can't bully gay people anymore. And And you thought this bus ride is going so well. Oh, it's going so well. Here I am (laughs) sitting, you know, side by side with these kids who are... You know, anti-gay bullying. And then um, they were talking about all the other people that you weren't allowed to to bully. And then then one of them said, but you can bully fat people. And he just outright said, you should bully fat people. And he was saying, because fat people um, need to be bullied, because that means that they're going to work to get thinner. It's good for them to be bullied, because then they'll actually turn their life around, become thinner. And they went off on this conversation, which was about economics. And they were talking about the economic burden of fat people on society. And I kind of suddenly heard their parents in the conversation. You know, it was like, (laughs) these two little kids (laughs) do not know about economics. Economics. They are really parroting their parents, and their parents have said, These fat people, they're, you know, of course, costing us health care of all things. Hey, were you in their line of sight when they were saying this? Were they looking at you? They didn't even notice me, but I was right in their line of sight. I was directly opposite them. They could have looked over and seen me in my fat body and realised the impact of what they were saying, but they were so in their own world that they were just discussing it as this kind of philosophical thing to talk about. So it wasn't pointed. It wasn't pointed to you. It wasn't. But it was just like you were invisible to them then. It was. But for me, it felt pointed because here I am sitting in my fat body being talked about very loudly within earshot of everyone on the bus discussing what my body is and how my body's a burden on society. And I couldn't take it. I had to leave the bus early. I had to get off and wait for the next bus because it was just horrific for me to sit there and be taken down by these two little kids. Like, it's one thing to be an axe murderer, but it's even worse to be a burden on the taxation system of Australia, isn't it? Um, (laughs) Apparently. (laughs) Apparently so. What are some of the other moral shortcomings that uh, fat people are supposed to be prone to? Well, we're supposed to be lazy um, because, obviously, if we're fat, we must sit on our bums all day and not do anything. You know, a good fat person is someone who's on a diet. A bad fat person is someone who doesn't engage with diet culture because um, we're supposed to be trying to get to the average size. Do you notice strangers watching what you eat in restaurants? Yeah, I do, actually. I do. I notice people, not not in fancy restaurants so much, but, you know, anywhere else in public. So um, if you're just in a cafe, in a food court, everyone will take a look at what, you've, what you're eating and you can tell that there's a judgment about what you're eating. So if there is a fat person eating a piece of cake, for whatever reason, it could be their birthday, there are people judging that fat person for eating that cake in public. And so I know many, many fat people who choose not to eat in public, or if they do, it's like performative eating. They have to eat the salad because 
that's the only thing that we are supposed to or allowed to eat is the green salad. So there are people who make these food choices in public because they're performing. They're performing the good fat person. It's not necessarily what they want to eat. It's not necessarily what they have to eat, but that's what they choose to eat as a performance. Were you big as a little kid and were you conscious of that? I was big as a little kid, but I wasn't conscious of it at first. I don't think really little kids know unless they're told. I don't remember being aware of it when I was very little, but um, I do remember a point in my life where I became aware of my size. And a lot of that was to do with my mother going on diets. There was a big period of time where Limits biscuits were a big thing. Oh, God. Do you I remember those? Yeah, I do, yeah. <laughs> Pretty much, though, for women of that era, it was cigarettes and pseudoephedrine that, that got you thin, wasn't it? That's Pretty right. Much. Yeah, yeah, it was. And, you know, my mother did smoke and my, my whole family smoked. But um, Limits biscuits were the thing yeah. that I remember being this kind of biscuit that were for adults and that we weren't allowed to eat. So, of course, it stuck in my head because right. it was Mommy like... special biscuits. <laughs> yeah, biscuits right. that we're not allowed to eat. <laughs> so that whole period where... I remember my mother dieting really impacted me because for the first time I kind of looked at her differently and kind of I'd never thought of her as a fat person. And um, she's not particularly fat but um, tends towards um, a larger size. And this whole kind of dieting process really made me think about her body and as a result it made me think about my body. So even as a little kid I started to look at myself and go, oh, I'm fat, when I hadn't thought about it before I was aware of the dieting process. What about your grandmother? Because as we've spoken from the past, your grandmother was sort of like the blazing sun in the middle of that house. She grew up in in Blacktown in the western suburbs of of Sydney and you're all kind of small planets orbiting around her most of the time. Was she a large woman or a thin woman? Most of her life she was a thin woman. Food was her kind of way of showing that she loved people. She cooked amazing meals and she fed us all. Would she say, I love you? No, no, no. She didn't have the language for love. But food was the language? But food was the language. So she fed us to show us that she loved us. So we had to eat what she served us. And it was it was amazing food. She was originally from Slovenia, but she'd spent her formative years in Egypt. And so a lot of the food that she was cooking us was Egyptian or sort of Middle Eastern or Mediterranean food. So that's what I grew up on. It was very different from the other kids at school. So um, it was interesting um, to have that as one measure that food became something that made me different from other people because I was eating this food that was different. Mothers and grandmothers in whatever culture can be pretty blunt about their daughter's or granddaughter's body size. Would would they ever turn around and say, oh, you're you're a fat girl or something like that? Would they say things like that? I don't remember it as a child, but I do remember it as an adult because I had a period where I dieted and like extremely. Um, I lost an awful lot of weight. And then at the end of that, I started to eat normally and I started to put on weight at that point. And I do remember visiting my grandmother and her commenting on the fact that I was putting on weight quite a lot and to the point that I even was very angry about it at one point and said to my mother, I just can't come and visit if I'm going to come here and be told that I'm fat every single time I come to visit. I can't come and visit you. And I think my mother had a little word with my grandmother and and told her that she wasn't allowed to mention my weight after that. But, you know, my grandmother was obsessive about her own weight. She was very careful to make sure that she remained slim. But then when she was in her 90s, she had a fall, she went to hospital, she had a hip surgery done at that age. So that's pretty extreme for a body to go through large surgery like that. She had a hip and and she had a broken leg too, so leg and hip surgery. And I remember being there when she came out of the anaesthetic and she was a bit confused, a bit teary, and then she looked down at herself because she'd been on drugs for other things, for health issues, for a few years, and it had made her a bit plump. And she looked down at herself and she started to cry and she said, how, how can this make me so fat? How can I be so fat? And at 98, she was crying because she'd put on weight. And I do remember watching her crying about her weight and thinking, I don't want to be 98 because, you know, I'd been on yet another diet. And I remember thinking, I don't want to be 98, looking down at myself and crying. 
if I'm 98, I want to be like, I'm 98. <laughs> I made it to 98. That's pretty amazing. I, I didn't want to be like that. I didn't want to be concerned about my weight. And ever since then, I have noticed that so many older people in their 80s and even in their 90s are going on diets. And I kind of think, man, if I'm in my 80s, I'm going to enjoy everything. Oh, hell yeah. I'm going to have a piece of cake if I want it. Yeah. I'm going to have that scotch. And that extra glass of wine. And yeah. that extra glass of wine. Yeah. There is no way I'm depriving myself if I make it to 80. <laughs> and it, it bothers me that these people are, you know, stopping themselves from having treats. School sport is a torment for kids in primary school if they're a larger size. Tell me your about your difficult, briefly glorious journey through school sport, please. I wasn't a very sporty kid. I was very terrible at sports and my family would give me a note to say that I didn't have to do sports because they didn't value sport. Um, so anything they didn't value, I didn't have to do. So I was normally quite happy to um, get my note and say I don't have to go to the sports carnival, I don't have to participate. But at one point in primary school I discovered shot put and discus and javelin and I realised... I was really good at them. <laughs> like like how good? Like beating everybody else. Right. Like beating everybody else you in the winning, school. Beating everyone else in the school. Getting so medals, I, like that sort of thing? Getting medals. I went to, well, it was only the one because I, I only did it for sort of one term. So I was practising and doing it because I loved it and it was really fun. I can throw things. <laughs> like I can still throw things. I'm very good at throwing and hitting a target. But at that time I didn't know it and it was it was this new and wonderful thing that I could actually throw things and hit a target. And so I practised and I went to the sports carnival and I won. And I won the medal for discus and I won the medal for shot book. And I was really proud of that because I'd never won medals for sport before. And I thought that was really cool. But then there was a bunch of the cool kids at school, the cool girls, who um, were laughing at me for my medals and I didn't know why. And they told me that only the fat kids were good at shot put and discus. I just looked around and saw the other kids that were competing in that sport and went, oh, yeah, it's only the fat kids that are competing in that oh, sport. Oh, and you've drawn attention to yourself now. And I had right. stood out as being one of those fat kids who can do that sport. So I just backed away from it immediately. I was like, so, so I don't in, want to do that. So in your mind, winning those medals was like being a champion, not at shot put or discus, but a champion of being fat or something. Exactly. Yeah, it felt like that to me. And so I really, I just, I dropped it. I didn't do it anymore. I just didn't want to be associated with fatness. Did you try and diet while you were still at school? Yeah, at high school, um, I suddenly at 15 decided this was it. I was going to actually become thin. The first few weeks were really hard because I was starving. But then I began to see that hunger as something good because I was losing weight. And so the hunger was actually a part of the good thing. When you say good, do you mean virtuous? Virtuous. Yeah. I was doing a virtuous thing by losing all this weight. I was also ex exercising like a demon, walking up and down the access road and just really trying to be as active as possible. But um, I lost so much weight and it was very bad on my body. It was yeah, a I was terrible say, thing. What effects was it having on your health? I became allergic to everything all of a sudden. So I suddenly started to get these horrible rashes all over my body if I came into contact with, well, we lived in the country and we had bore water to shower in, so it was groundwater. And I suddenly became allergic to the bore water, just made my skin inflamed and, and red. What about headaches? Oh, massive. I'd always had migraines, but um, they became really constant. So migraines were constant. And I also got the kissing disease, what's that called? Glandular fever. Glandular fever, that's it. Um, so I got glandular fever, which I hadn't kissed anyone, so uh, I don't know how I'd gotten it. But um, I think it was because my immune system was so low. I got glandular fever right through my um, grade 12 exams. So I, I spent weeks in bed before the exams and was incredibly lightheaded and just felt like I couldn't think. And then um, I floated my way through those exams because I was still suffering the effects of glandular fever. So I was, I was really not well. This is a really strange question. Maybe it doesn't make sense to you, but did you feel like it was the real you in that slim body or were you 
impersonating someone else, hiding in another body or something. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. And I always felt like a fat person, even when I was in the, that skinny body, that size six body. I felt like I was a fat person in hiding. And there was a certain, there was a pleasure and pain with people making positive comments about that thin body that I was in, because the pleasure was that I was being noticed as thin and I was I was given extra attention and certainly extra sexual attention, which something as a, you know, a teenager, I was really excited to be sexy for the first time. So that was happening. But I was also angry because those people who were giving me attention for being thin wouldn't like the real me. They wouldn't like that fat person that I actually was. They only liked the thin person that I was pretending to be. So there was this really strange dichotomy between wanting the praise that I was getting for being thin, and I was getting so much praise for being thin, but also not not feeling like those people were good people because they would never have praised me for being fat. So, um, yeah, it's it's really strange. You know, they could never win um, because I didn't trust anybody and I didn't trust anybody's... I didn't trust anybody who said I was a good person. You said that around about this time you realised you could be as fiercely attracted to girls as you could be to boys at the same time. And given that you'd kind of reinvented yourself in another body, were people in the culture like David Bowie or Kate Bush really important to you? As pop stars, they're kind of like these fabulous aliens. They absolutely are. And I was, these are the people who I grew up listening to. I grew up listening to Kate Bush and David Bowie, and they were absolutely important for me. But there was a really interesting moment, um, and this was just before I lost the weight. So this was, I think I would have been, um, in, I would have been 15 at the time, when Divine, the singer, oh, yeah. had a hit. <laughs> Molly Meldrum played it on Countdown. You think you're a man, but you're only a boy. Absolutely. Yeah. And I was, I was <laughs> besotted. Like, I fell in love the moment I saw that on Countdown. I, I saw that come on, and I just thought, I felt like it was me on the screen because here is Divine and Divine is a female impersonator. Um, But Divine in this incredibly glittery, tight dress that shows all her curves and here she is being kick-ass saying, you know, you're not man enough to satisfy me. (laughs) And I suddenly felt like I saw myself. Um, So it was really interesting that there was this little glimmer early on of not only seeing myself as queer and not only seeing myself as gender um, diverse and not even knowing that that's what I was doing, but also seeing myself as fat and kind of embracing it briefly (laughs) for the moment that that hit song. So that's for the moment though. But for the larger part of the time, did you kind of feel like, I don't know, an alien yourself walking on it? Like this, I'm not quite of this tribe of humans that I'm walking around with? I did, yeah. Look, I didn't see anybody else around me um, apart from, you know, David Bowie. This is country Queensland you're living in at this point, isn't it? It is country Queensland. And I was bisexual and I didn't see any bisexuals around me at all in the real world. Um, I remember seeing Rocky Horror Picture Show and suddenly... Here I was again as um, Dr. Frankenfurter in um, stockings and suspenders and telling Brad and Janet that they were hot and um, seducing both of them at the same time. And and I saw myself again. So, you know, I I was constantly finding these little glimpses of myself in these um, queer performers. And um, David Bowie was probably the first queer performer that made me aware that there were other people like me out there as well and that they were aliens too and that aliens were okay. Your grandmother had put you under a lot of pressure to become, to be a kind of a virginal fairy tale princess. And there was a point <laughs> where you realised, I just don't think I'm going to do that for the rest of my life. And that coincided with you going to uni for the first time. Yeah. How much fun did you were you able to have at uni with your slim down body? Oh, so much fun. <laughs> it was it was like I was, um, you know, a kid released into a candy store because at home I hadn't been even allowed to watch a kiss on TV that went for too long. You know, the TV would be shut off. I wasn't allowed to see any images of sexuality at all unless I was sneaking a look at it. So um, when I left home, I realised that there was no one stopping me from doing anything I wanted and including my body. My body no longer stopped me from seducing people because I was in this thin body. And so therefore, 
when I asked people to have sex with me, they often said yes, almost always said yes. So I took the best advantage of that that I possibly could and I went out hunting every night and hunted people, had a great time, never wanted to see them again, and then went out the next night and found somebody else. Given that one of the reasons why you felt like you were able to do that was because you were living in this punishingly slim body that required you to diet fiercely and be hungry all the time that was not good for your health. Was there some element in your mind then, I have achieved this then, I have made myself into this sexy, desirable person and it's it's an act of will or something like that? Yeah, there was. There was. I certainly felt a sense of achievement and I was fully aware at the time that I wouldn't be able to do this in my previous body. I mean, I don't know. Maybe that was a lie. Maybe I would have been able to. Maybe I would have been able to take my, um, you know, curvy, round body out into the world and ask people to have sex with me and maybe they still would have said yes. But in my mind, it was um, this achievement of being this thin, hungry hunter that became my identity and became the way that I could actually achieve this very sexual life. This is Conversations with Richard Feidler. To find out more, just head to abc.net.au slash conversations. After you left uni, sometime after you left uni, you met and fell in love with your partner, Anthony, and he's a lovely man. You guys have been together, what, for two decades? Longer than that now? 31 years. Oh, 31 years. My God. How about that? <laughs> was your size ever a thing he talked to you about or was that a thing between you or a bond or a problem between you? No, I mean, I've spoken about it to him across the years, but he has fiercely loved me at every size. And when he met me, I was still in my hungry years. So I was still incredibly thin. And when I settled into the relationship with him, I started to um, cook healthy food for us both. So I started to eat. um, And it was, you know, it was food that was beautiful. Like I knew how to cook because my grandmother had been such a great cook. Food is love again. Food is love, mm. absolutely. And of course, Anthony has this very high metabolism. And so Anthony would eat this incredibly beautiful food and his weight has remained the same since he was 16, basically. So um, I'd be just eating the healthy meals that I was cooking and I'd be putting on the weight. And so I quickly became a round person and then rounder and then rounder. And then, of course, I would see myself and, and those voices would come back to me and I would think that he wouldn't love me at this size. You know, I would actually have these thoughts that I'd lose him because he would look at me and suddenly realise that I was fat. But that's not what happened. It's not what happened. But it did, I I did diet. Like I did go back on regular diets and I'd lose weight being hungry again. But then as soon as the diet would stop, I'd put the weight on and more. So you've got a story in your book about how you joined him on a work trip. He had to go on to Vanuatu. And how did local women react to your size. How did they talk about you while you were with local women in Vanuatu? Well, they actually thought I was beautiful. It was the first time... Did they say that? that, Well, yeah, they said that that I was fat and beautiful. These were the young girls. Anthony was making a documentary over there, so there was a lot of young people he was working with. It was very much a gender divide, and so the girls would flock to me and sit with me and talk with me. And um, they would look at me and say, oh, you're fat and beautiful. And it was the first time I'd come across the concept that fat was actually culturally beautiful for them. And I, I definitely felt it everywhere, not just from the girls. There were there were a lot of um there was a lot of unwanted attention from right. men on the <laughs> island as well. Which was not not as nice as no. the, the lovely bits. But you know, there there was certainly this feeling that my body in that place was seen as beautiful and sexy. Then they told you about a creature was living in the waters nearby. Tell me about this creature, please, Chris. It was a dugong and it had been... a Dugong's mate for life, which is really sweet. But this particular dugong, it was a male and had had a female dugong that it was mated with. And the female dugong had been killed a couple of years before. So this dugong was alone now because his partner was gone and he 
lived off the coast there. And they did tell me, go down and, and swim and he'll, he, you may see him in the water. And if you do, they told Anthony to get out of the water because he sometimes was aggressive and territorial with the local men. Men? Men. So not women? Not women. He said, you, you'll be safe if you're a woman. Um, safe, yes. <laughs> well, uh, so this dugong came up and Anthony... Well, what do you mean it came up? I mean, <laughs> what, what, how were you aware that there was a du- when you were in the water that there was suddenly a dugong there? Well, Anthony and I were both in the water and we kind of were swimming and having a great time and then we looked around and there was something coming towards us and I was like, oh, my God, that's the dugong. And Anthony scrambled out of the water as, you know, as he was told to do <laughs> in case the thing attacked him. But you stayed. <laughs> but I wanted to stay because here's this incredibly huge creature that I'd never encountered before. Like, was it big, bigger than a human? Me. Bigger it, than... Was t- it was longer than me. Right. And it was it was a big creature and it was coming towards me. And I'm only, okay, I'm five foot, so it doesn't take much to get bigger than me. But it was it was more than five foot. And it was coming towards me and I was nervous because it was huge. Have you ever been that close to a beast in the wild before? No, never. Nothing that big. So that must have been incredibly exciting. It was exciting, but I was also terrified because I didn't know how it would behave. They said that I'd be okay. And so I, I stayed and it came closer and it came closer and it came closer. And then it rolled onto its side and grabbed me with its flippers around the waist. (laughs) And I was, like, shaking but, like, excited and terrified. And I I started petting him on his belly, which was pressed up against me, and he felt sort of tight and like a snake skin, so that that feeling of a snake, really. And and, and was he... Was the dugong embracing you? It was embracing me. It had his flippers around my waist. Was it was it a gentle embrace or like a, a, a bit of a bit of a bone crushing embrace? It was no. It was gentle. It was just like gently touching the my sides. So you know, I I was caressing him, and then I tried to caress his, <laughs> pet him on his back, but he was covered in like really sharp barnacles. Because this dugong, as I was kind of caressing his stomach, I realised I was getting further and further away from shore. Oh God! <laughs> so this creature was just like gently tugging me away from the shore out to sea. And I only was aware of it because Anthony kind of called out to me and went, he's taking you out to sea. (laughs) Come back. (laughs) Come back. And so I kind of pushed away from him and um, started to go back towards shore. And then he came after me again and grabbed me around the waist and then gently started taking me out to sea. And this was wonderful, but I just, I didn't know, I didn't know what to do. I would have loved to let him take me out to sea to see what happens, but I didn't feel safe (laughs) and I wasn't quite sure what was going to happen. So eventually after, you know, around about a half an hour of this, I eventually pushed him away and and got out of the water and and went back onto the land. You know, I'm sure you're aware that it's often thought that the medieval tales we have of mermaids, mermen, these creatures were thought to have been dugongs. So what we're saying here is that this dugong was proposing to take you to his watery kingdom and make you his queen. Absolutely. And I was almost up for it. (laughs) I have to admit there was a temptation there. But, um, you know, obviously it was not to be. I'm just really struck by you and Kate Forsyth have so many episodes in your lives where you have these fairy tale stories, these fairy tale moments, and this is so much like one of those. And those stories of, you know, sailors going off with the mermaids, they, it does end in drownings. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, lucky that was not the ending of this story. But I did feel incredibly special, and I've never experienced that again. I've gone looking for dugong since, and I've never seen one in the wild. Often, of course, the issues that are raised about people who are fat, as you say, are questions of health, you know, are you going to die a premature death? You had what you thought was a bit of a heart scare at one point. What were the symptoms you were getting? I was getting chest pain, uh, like a band of, of hot pain around my chest. And I was pretty sure that it wasn't my heart because I'd had this pain before. But along with the pain came pain in my arm as well, which is often a sign that you're having a heart attack. And so I eventually went to hospital. And what was it like getting your blood pressure tested? Oh, they it's really impossible. And I think there'll probably be um, fat people out there who will really relate to this. But the, the blood pressure cuffs, 
don't work for people my size. What do you mean? If they put them on and start inflating it, it's excruciatingly painful because they're too small. So to get to their proper inflation, they can't on an arm my size. And they do have larger blood pressure cuffs, but they're made for a longer arm. They're made with a male body in mind. So for them to get an accurate blood pressure assessment is near impossible. And what kind of a reading was it giving? It was reading really high right. because I was in excruciating pain every time it inflated. Of course. And then what happened when you asked them to put on like a manual cuff, like an old-fashioned blood pressure testing cuff? Yeah, they did one manually and um, it read normal. It read as a normal blood pressure. But up until then, your blood pressure readings had been falsely high. Yes, Yep, they had been falsely high. So therefore, a lot of fat people are actually diagnosed with high blood pressure when they don't have high blood pressure. They just have badly fitting equipment. Still, it was assumed that your your heart was larded up with cholesterol. What did an angiogram reveal? When you have the angiogram, they put the, the catheter or whatever it is up your arm, they squirt a dye into your heart, they take x-rays from all sorts of different positions. I think it's the most accurate way, as far as I know, of getting a reading of how congested your heart is. What did that reveal? That my veins and arteries were completely clear. There was absolutely no issue at all. Because you eat healthy, fresh food. Because my Mm. diet is incredibly, like, I'm very adverse to um, processed food, which was, you know, drilled into me by my grandmother. And so my diet is incredibly good. But people just assume that because of my weight, I'm going to have heaps of issues with my heart and I'm going to have build up in my arteries. And the doctor who took the readings was completely shocked at how clear my arteries were. She said, I really expected that there'd be a problem there. And she was like completely shocked to see that it was completely clear. You were given by your partner a a certificate to go on a diving course. You were planning to go on a huge hike around Tasmania. What's involved in finding the kind of gear you need to wear to go about these adventures? It's almost impossible as a fat person to find the gear that you need to exercise properly. There just isn't anything in our size and you have to order it online and then you're just taking a guess at what size you'll be. If you're going into the shop, to try things on. What kind of an ordeal is that? You know that you're not going to find anything to start with. So I I rarely even look at a shop these days. Like I, I rarely even look at a clothes shop because for me it's just a place that is not for me. But when I was trying to get myself up for the walk, I needed to find gear to wear. So I did risk going into those kind of trekking adventure stores and the look on the person's face when I turned up and was looking for stuff in my size, you could tell that she was just not up for that that day. She was like, no, there's not going to be anything in the shop that's going to fit you. Right. So you've got to get more exercise, but you've got no business being in the shop. Absolutely. Uh. Absolutely. So it's like, how can you actually expect somebody to be active and fit, regardless of whether that's going to make them lose weight or not, without having the exercise gear that they can do that in. It just doesn't make any sense to me. You've written a lot of erotic fiction in the past, as well as a lot about sex, written essays about sex. Getting used to the idea of your naked body as a larger person is obviously something you wanted to take on. So your partner took some photos of you, and they're throughout your book, of your naked body, but extreme close-up photos of the curves and folds of your body so you can sort of go, oh, what's that? I can't quite <laughs> make that <laughs> Looks out. Looks a bit rude, but I'm not sure. <laughs> oh, yeah. Some, well, there was one picture up and I went, whoa, and I went, oh, no, that's just... That's just, <laughs> that's just an arm. That's just, that's just an arm. <laughs> Hello. What was it like to do that, those kind of photos with Anthony? I mean, obviously, there's a lot of trust there with you and him. There is a lot of trust. And, um, you know, he was very excited about the process because he loves photography and he's, um, you know, he's a filmmaker and he loves taking photographs. And he really enjoyed taking photographs of my body because he could, you know, he could spill the light on different bits of flesh and and make it look moody and um, change the shapes because there's lots of curves to kind of um, change the shape of. But for me, it was quite confronting because I used to try not to look at myself in the mirror. I used to try not to um, just to look down at my body when I was naked. I didn't want to see myself because all of those negative judgments have clouded my vision of myself for my entire life. And what was the thought behind that? Was it was it that I don't want to look because that's me or I don't want to look because that's not me? I didn't want to see the reality of what my body really was. 
I think I knew in my heart that I was fat. But I've, as I said, I've been in hiding. I haven't been out about my fatness. And so if I don't see it, I can imagine myself not as fat as I actually am. So there was some kind of magical thinking going on that if I couldn't actually see my body, that it wasn't as fat as it was. But to actually take photographs of it is confronting the reality of it. And in a way, looking back at those photographs again and again, it's normalising it. So the initial shock of kind of thinking, that's not the body that I think I'm in, it settles over time because you see those pictures and you see them again and again and you realise this is what that picture is going to look like every time I look at it and this is what my body is going to look like every time I look at it. There's something else going on with those photos, though. They're photos taken by a man who looks at you with love and desire. Yes. Can you see those photos through his eyes? I can now. You know, I can. At first I couldn't, but... um, I do see that when he sees me, he sees all those beautiful curves. He sees all the bits that I'm ashamed of. He sees it in a different light to the way I see it. And in a way, he kind of helps me see myself in that way as well. You've been a painter as well as a writer, and so you started painting naked self-portraits. One in particular, I suspect when you do that, you have to understand or you learn how the various volumes on your body are composed and how they sit together and how they connect up. What does that do for you when, you, when you're painting your body? It was a really important activity for me to do because as a painter, when I have been in classes where there's been a model, you never judge that model for what their body looks like. You're not kind of judging them as a person. You're looking at them as something to paint. You're looking at them as shape and light and texture. And so when I actually had to start to, well, I was forcing myself to paint my own body nude, um, I had to get over that initial self-judgment and that initial self-talk, which was there right at the beginning. And I, I couldn't look at the photographs without feeling that extreme shame that I felt about my own body. But then the more I got into the process of painting, the more I remembered how it was to see as a as an artist and how it was to see as someone that's painting something and is trying to get to the heart of what they see, to see myself from a distance and to value myself as an artistic product, I suppose. You know, I've known you for uh, nearly two decades, maybe 15 years maybe, I don't know. And I'm going to embarrass you now. You're, you're someone who's actually, I know, gets a lot of love. You do have a lot of love in your life, not just from your partner, but you're a very well-loved figure in your your own community. I wonder what it means to have to work so hard to find self-acceptance despite all this love that comes your way. Mm. It's really interesting. I'm sure that other people feel like they're in the same position as me because I do know that there are people who love me. But then when I go home and I'm by myself, in the evenings often, I it just the weight of my own self-judgment just falls so heavily. There's going to be a whole lot of people listening to this conversation wondering when you are going to take that next step to the obvious, obvious next step to address these body shame issues, which is what everyone knows is burlesque dancing. (laughs) Burlesque dancing. It is, yes. That's the way through. (laughs) That's the way through. We we all know this. We all go through the burlesque dancing part of our lives. I'm sure we do. At some point in our lives. Seriously, burlesque dancing, is it a kind of a caricature of sexy womanhood or is it sexy womanhood? What is it anyway to your mind? Look, I think um, I should have known that it was actually a great activity for me to do because I should have remembered the Rocky Horror Picture Show and my pure joy when I could perform Dr. Frankenfurter as a kid. And I should have remembered Divine. Corsets. (laughs) Corsets and stockings. I should have remembered Divine being on stage in that incredible sequin dress, um, figure-hugging dress. I started to look at burlesque because I I wanted to ask the plump burlesque dancers, and there were a few of them in this particular school, I wanted to ask them why they were doing it and how they could reveal their bodies so easily in front of an audience. And so, of course, being me, I couldn't just do interviews with people. I had to actually immerse myself in the whole burlesque world and sign up for classes, which 
was horrific at the time because I suddenly realised I'd signed up to take all my clothes off in front of people. And wear high heels too. <laughs> and wear high which heels. Which is, if anything, probably more trickier and more embarrassing. Yeah, yeah, that was that's right. actually still problematic, but that's all right. <laughs> um, but, yeah, signing up for burlesque dancing was actually, it, it, it was scary at first, but I should have realised it was all those drag fantasies that I'd had as a kid. <laughs> It was pure drag. It was sequins. It was tassels. It was feathers. So tell me where you decided to have your big breakout performance of (laughs) you as this drag person in front of an audience doing your sort of semi-naked fan dance. Well, I ended up doing it at the Sydney Writers (laughs) Festival (laughs) in front of an audience of over a 1,000 people. (laughs) It was insane. Tell me how that, that performance unfolded like this amazing thing before the audience at the Sydney Rights Festival. Oh, look, it um, mm. it was part of Queer Stories, which has always been a wonderful thing to be at. It's where a bunch of queer writers of different strokes come together and read for 10 minutes each. And so I've done that a few times. But when she asked me to do it for the Sydney Writers Festival, I thought, look, this is the time the book I'm working on is Fat Girl Dancing. This is the time for the fat person to dance. So... I decided that I would read a bit from the the work in progress. I would read a section about doing burlesque dancing and do the burlesque dance as a part of that. And does that mean strip teasing? It does. So it meant that I came on stage with a giant in a giant coat to cover everything, um, and started to read about how um, I joined the burlesque class and I felt really uncomfortable about it because I was fat and I didn't like my body. What am I doing to myself? And then I'd like have a little sting from the hot chocolate you sex thing. Yes. <laughs> I would kind of start to play. I'd walk away from the podium, stripped off my big coat and there's a glittery dress just like Divine underneath and stockings. And then I'd go back and do a bit more reading and then there'd be another hot chocolate sting and I'd come out and I'd unzip the dress and throw that away and there'd be underwear, there'd be, you know, lace and corsets and bras. And then I basically got all the way down to the nipple tassels. <laughs> And after I started wow. doing it, because I was terrified of doing this whole thing in front of, you know, over a thousand people. But then when I started doing it, the audience's reaction to that first time when I took off the coat, there was just this roar from the audience as people just suddenly realised what was going to happen. And they just roared. And every time that hot chocolate sting came on, they just started clapping and started clapping in time and cheering. And it just became this playful thing where they were really wanting me to take my clothes off. (laughs) And I really wanted to take my clothes off at that point. (laughs) So instead of being frightened of it, it became this incredible joyous dance. It's just a body in space enjoying itself and um, doing what the audience wants it to do. So I really love that feeling of dropping all the shame and just stepping out of it and having fun with people. Maybe this is a really silly question, I don't know. But if there was a new drug that was suddenly available that would tweak your metabolism safely and allow you to become that person, thin person you were for a while by starving yourself. You didn't have to do that. You could still eat healthily. And you did do that for whatever reason. You decided to do that as an experiment or because you might want to do it. I don't know. Would something be lost? Well, look, I I think I'm a bit torn because... I know that there would be some gains from losing a bit of weight in terms of um, flexibility, in terms of accessibility. Like going out into the world is really tricky as a fat person. It's, you know, going on planes, going into toilet cubicles, going into shops that have narrow aisles is always an issue. So I still am always going to be the fat person, you know, even if I lost weight at some point, I am still going to be that fat person inside the thin body. And I feel like that fat person, when they're allowed out to dance, is an incredible joyful beast. And I think that there would be a certain sense of loss in terms of losing, you know, I've I've embraced the fact that I'm a freak now. Like, I mean, and I say freak in the nicest possible way. I was doing a lot of research into the fat women at the the circus and the role of the fat woman at the circus and, and thinking about them and how they are in control of an audience and they're up on stage going, I am the fattest person in the world and your girlfriend can touch my thigh for an extra dollar. You know, that kind of power to kind of flirt with an audience and to kind of say... I'm the fattest person in the world. There is some power in that as well. So I would lose, 
I would lose that kind of freakishness that I have now, which, oh, look, I don't know. I'm, I'm, this is this is really hard. That's a hard question, Richard, because I think I'd, I'd jump at it. I think I'd take, if someone could magically wave a wand and make me thin, I would jump at it. And I'm pretty sure that most people in fat bodies would jump at it. But what I wouldn't take away is the knowledge of what it's like to live in a fat body because I think that what it's given me is um, a lot of compassion for people living in bodies that are not normative. It's given me a lot of pleasure in some ways because this amount of skin that I'm in gets to roll around in a world and um, there's a lot of pleasure in rolling around in the world and feeling the textures and the sun and the the water and, and all the things I feel on my skin. And I know you can still feel that in a thin body, but um, I've certainly had an excess of that in my fat body. So I I think that there would be some knowledges of the world that I've gained living in a fat body that I would retain and cherish. But, you know, if someone said, I can make you thin tomorrow, I would jump at it. You know, I wouldn't, I'd jump at it, but I wouldn't jump at it at all costs. Like I wouldn't say if someone said, I'll make you thin tomorrow, but you'll lose 10 years of your life. Or be hungry all the time again. Or be hungry all the Mm. time. I'd say no. But if someone can wave a magic wand, not change my relationship to food so I can still enjoy my beautiful meals and yet be in a thin body doing that, I'd totally jump at it in a second. Chris, what a joy it is always to speak with you on this program. Oh, queen of the sunken realm of Atlantis. Thank you so much, Chris. (laughs) Thanks, Richard. Chris Neen's book is called Fat Girl Dancing. I'm Richard Feidler. Thanks for listening. You've been listening to a podcast of Conversations with Richard Feidler. For more Conversations interviews, please go to the website abc.net.au slash conversations. Discover more great ABC podcasts, live radio and exclusives on the ABC Listen app.